record. All right, so we're back. And Shruti just said, people in developing countries like mine. I hate this term because, by the way, my name is Samson. I'm here uh, explaining to Shruti my opinion on developing countries. Who named you? Who designated you a developing country? Go. No, please don't do this. Did you wake up and say, hey, we're a developing country because we're not as good as you? Did you wake up and say, we're a developing country because we're not as mature as you? Did, did, who who, who it, it said you're a developing country? It is exactly the country? same institution who, who deemed themselves as developed and making others developing and then giving the, the rate for the currency, right? Otherwise, why would there be a currency conversion rate? It's exactly somehow all the same institutions or organizations, in my opinion, who, mm -hmm. who came up with such amazing ideas, I guess. Uh, you call them amazing. I call them very interesting and suspect. It's because sarcasm. In order... It is sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> in, order, in order for me to substantiate the claim that I am better than you, I change the language, I change the nomenclature, the jargon, the lexicon, I change how you think about yourself. And if I can convince you that you are less, that you are not as good as, that you are developing, guess what? I, I am fundamentally altering your perception of not only yourself, but your place in the world, because I make you feel less. Right. And when I make you feel less, you feel that you are entitled to less justice, less equality, less civil rights, less human rights. And as soon as I make you feel that you are less entitled to less justice, less human rights, less civil rights, everything else opens up, you will find yourself exploited. And so we have to be very aware that when we're facing the vestiges of colonialism, here in America, we face the vestiges of slavery all the time. As I tell folks, my grandparents came to America in chains. We were enslaved. We were not slaves. And this is very important because when you are conquered, when someone defeats you militarily, they may enslave you. But if you are mentally not a slave, you will never be a slave yeah. because we are always fighting for equal rights, civil rights, human rights. Yeah. And so you got to be very careful when you're saying we're a developing country. That is your oppressor putting words in your mouth to make you feel less. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just that, uh, you know, I have friends like you who make me aware of the reality. But otherwise, I think most people may know about this or may not know about this and are not aware to how all of this really plays, isn't it? And you, you know you're dealing with an oppressive system when the oppressor tells you you're not being professional for bringing it up. You're like, oh, what do you mean? Like, oh, this makes, the oppressor will tell you, the colonizer will tell you, this topic makes me feel uncomfortable. Like me trying to figure out my civil rights, human rights, and judicial rights makes you feel uncomfortable. And there's a pause. Yeah. And you're like, I'm all asking is parity, equality. I'm not asking for an advantage. I'm just asking that we be treated equally. And if your equality, if you speaking up for equality makes you feel, makes you unprofessional, it's because you're in such a biased and systemically racist system that the oppressor is like, oh my God, I feel attacked because this person I've been oppressing for 400 years now wants to be my peer. You, you won't so, believe, I, I wrote a post on LinkedIn maybe a month ago or something where I was talking I don't have a problem that you're paying for the same job a person in US uh, very, very higher compared to someone in India. And you know, not a single American had to do anything because all the Indians were like, this is how it is Shruti and this is how it should be. And their work was already done. And I was like, how can you not support? Uh, and it's not even about support, right? It's just about looking at the fact what's happening with us. If you see uh, the 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 2021 or 2022 uh, report with respect to how much a solutions engineer earns in a US versus a UK versus Australia, India was not even on the list. Like th until last year, it was still there with, you know, a small bar somewhere. And it showed how much of a huge gap there is in the pay scale. 
And this year, we weren't even there on that bar graph, despite having more data than Australia. And when I wrote a post about saying that, you know, one of the NRI guys, like he was also an Indian who was like, yeah, the same job for a person in US would uh, be getting more money because, you know, there are no taxes in India. And I was like, how long have you not been in India? Because there are too many taxes in India. Like literally way too many. Even the interest in our banks are taxed. So you don't even have to be somebody who's employed or not employed. If you just put your money in a bank, even that is going to be taxed, the interest on it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, because previously we had a conversation about blockchain, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and other buzzwords that people are often confused about. And I'm just going to sum it up again by saying technology doesn't solve human problems. Only humans can. And so part the biggest challenge of solving a human problem is getting a two groups of humans to have an open and honest discourse about what is the problem. And so what blockchain cryptos and uh, all these other fancy buzzwords, the problems they tiptoe around, capitalism, colonialism, racism. No one wants to ever actually tackle those. They'll come up with all these, oh, there's a great meme that says, uh, men in America will start five startups versus going to therapy, which is sort of true. Um, and so we never come to that truth and reconciliation moment where we address, particularly here in America, uh, slavery. Uh, actually, we go colonialism, then slavery, then capitalism, and how it shaped our current society. Instead, we come up with all of these technology solutions that don't address the root cause. So, for yourself as a technologist and anyone who happens to be watching this who are also technologists, you're going to learn that if you, particularly in the office and in your life, if you want to lead people, lead humans, you don't need technology to do that. You need emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence, I can't train, I can't, you can't download emotional intelligence. I can give you an app and it can tell you this is emotional intelligence, try to practice it, then you'll be faking it and you'll run a across me and I'm like, you're not confident, you're faking this. You create, your, your, your responses are those that are in an app that I may or may not have programmed. Because at the end of the day, what technologies are supposed to do is translate human emotions into these devices. Most of the time, because they do not have emotional intelligence themselves, it fails, or they perpetrate our biggest inequities racism, colonialism, sexism, and put it into these handheld devices. Yeah. So I'm going to sum this up because I do have to go in a moment to say, if you want to be an amazing technologist, learn some emotional intelligence. Practice your emotional intelligence. You can go really far out on the, on the limb and be empathetic. It will blow your mind. I'm not sure how we went into this part two of the conversation, but I'm glad we did because I feel emotional intelligence, either you have it or you don't. You can't train somebody for that. There's, there's no gray area in that. It's binary. It's one or zero. And again, it's, you know, one of the philosophies or prejudices that we are taught where emotionally intelligent people are either considered sensitive or weak. And they're not considered as strong as other people who probably have ego and greed and, you know, notions about whatever kind of conquering the world. So I will let you know that why emotional intelligence is so powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I work in finance here in America and every sociopath, they have high levels of awareness about emotional intelligence because they know what is socially acceptable, what is culturally acceptable, and because they need to fake it. Because nowadays, when you're in office settings, you're supposed to be civil. And it's the worst word ever. Because civil, depending on which side of the gun you're on, is, it means something different. And so look at sociopaths, because they're very aware that they've read about emotional intelligence in a book. And so for them, the world is their stage. And they're just playing, pretending, acting to be that way so they can navigate to the top. And so this is where there's power in knowing emotional intelligence. And two things to remember, um, books and 
uh, things are managed. Books, inventories, catalogs are managed. People are led. So if you want to lead people, you got to inspire them. And in order to inspire them, this Zoom call, this piece of technology does not inspire me. What inspires me is like, oh my God, look at Shruti. I'm so excited to see her. Give me a hug. I'm inspired. And so this is where you've got to think, how do you in your daily, in your day-to-day -day routine, how do you inspire anyone? Most people have a challenge inspiring themselves because they're like, oh, I have to inspire me. Yes, it turns out you are the only person who will show up for you. Because if you don't show up for yourself, I'm great, I'm awesome, I'm powerful, I can do this, I'm capable of anything and everything. No one will tell you, I'm, you're great, you're awesome, you're capable, you're powerful, you can do that. So again, part of your emotional intelligence is just getting to know yourself. I highly recommend going fishing so you can sit on the water, catch fish, meditate, take a photo with the fish and throw it back and repeat the process for eight to 12 hours. And then when you come back to your house and people say, what did you do all day? And you'd be like, nothing. And you'd be like, oh, it doesn't seem very productive. You'd be like, because in the world nothing of capitalism. Most, doing nothing is the most productive thing to do, maybe. And it is so hard to do nothing in today's modern society because this is going on. You've got emails. And so I often tell people when I go fishing, I'm really meditating about doing nothing. Yeah. And Because at the end of the day, when I have, what am I going to show you that I accomplished? I'm going to look you dead in the eye and said, nothing. I spoke to myself. I talked to myself. I gave myself affirmations for eight to 12 hours. I sat with nature soaking up the sun and I have absolutely nothing to show for it other than this great disposition that I achieved nothing. <laughs> That's awesome. But I have a quick question. Do you then probably happen to kill the fish and throw it back? I take a picture. I take a picture and throw it back. But does it get killed in the... No. Oh, thank God. Okay. Yeah. Sure, right? As sometimes I do eat fish, but when I'm fishing, I'm only there to do nothing. No, I just wanted to clarify, like, what we are practicing is what we are preaching and nothing else. Uh, oh, don't get me wrong. I'm still American. I'm from Texas specifically, so I'm always up to some evilness. So you should take anything I say with a grain of salt. But occasionally need a bad man to tell you the right thing to do because a good man, they won't tell you the right thing to do because they're only focused on doing right or doing good, not right. And sometimes the right thing to do, it takes a bad person to do it because it takes a certain level of steel resiliency and belief to stand up and do the right thing because it is never popular to do the right thing because nine times out of 10, when a good person does the right thing, someone says, why are you such a revolutionary? Why are you causing so many problems, Ruthie? Why are you saying you should get Basically, paid? Basically, tell me that honest trees are cut first. Because, you know, when a, a good person with not a position of power is doing something the right way for the people, you're like, the honest tree will be cut first. But I think with you, you're probably, I'm not sure if you're a bad guy or not. I am trying to understand. But when you're coming from a position of power, if you're doing something bad if that can go to so much of ripple effect definitely doing the right thing would help the society at large mm -hmm. um so here in america uh, amongst black folks because you know we're always somewhere fighting for civil rights and human rights um because we're trying to deal with the vestiges of slavery we have a phrase called good trouble and so occasionally when we go to march people get arrested you get beat you get maced uh, occasionally we get shot but that's good trouble because you're saying the system as it is, is wrong. There's something inherently, fundamentally wrong about the system. So you should never be afraid of getting into good trouble. Because when a good person goes to do the right thing, the system will often say, you're a troublemaker. Yeah. In which case, hey, I'm going to start some, I'm going to be a troublemaker because I'm going to get in good trouble. So I'm going to conclude this by saying, Shruti, go get in some good trouble. Sure. Thank you so much, Samson. Thank you so much. This part two was not even planned, but this, this went really great. Thank you.